Ladies and gentlemen, tonight's performance will include Ancient Ivory, Heavenly Crowns, and Snow White herself as we discuss the art of the Assumption here on Created Things. Hi-ho and welcome to Created Things, a podcast of Catholic creatives and the only arts podcast where we regularly make an ass out of you and me. I am artist and psychotherapist Jacob Flores Popcheck. With me, as always, is my good and excellent friend, my sensei, my my brother in Christ, uh, medievalist and Catholic priest, Father Gabriel Toretta. How are you doing, good sir? Hi, girl. Hi. Doing good. <laughs> feeling sassy feeling, feeling sassy i'm feeling sassy i um i woke up this morning and uh the, me- the, air- the neighborhood where i live in is uh primarily mexican and um there is this thing uh at least in my neighborhood that i'd never heard of before which is like when you okay you wake up and you say to yourself i went to bed like at like two in the morning and am wrecked I need something that will like get me ready to seize the day. Mm-hmm. And you say like, do I go out and I get like huevos rancheros or something? You think like, no, I do not do that. No, that is like a, that is like a grade school move. Um, if you live in like an entirely Mexican neighborhood, what you do uh, is you go down to the carnitas restaurant uh, mm. that is only open from like 5 a.m. to, to 3 a.m to 3 p.m excuse me um and uh it's, like, it's a it's, it's an like, out of time yeah it's, it's a weird it's a weird situation Merlin's Carnitas restaurant it just yeah, they it, experience time in a backwards, backwards motion, yeah exactly it's totally cool. style. uh so you just like so you so you go there at like 8 a.m and there's no menu you just say like carnitas for however many people you are and they bring you like a pound of carnitas and like tortillas and fixings and like whole pickled jalapenos and you just like eat like a pound of meat at 8 a.m. But there's a cup of coffee, so you know it's breakfast. Right, um, yeah, that's and, what makes it breakfast. And at the end of the affair, like you are ready to seize the day uh, and go back to bed for the next 24 hours. Um, <laughs> and I did this today and it just like it was amazing. It like I have no regrets. This was like a, the perfect way to spend my morning. Uh, the perfect way to spend my life, in fact, is like Cardita's breakfast. So, yeah. That sounds that sounds like the life. That sounds like such a mood, as the kids say these days. Yeah, it is. It's incredible, and partly I think this is because like I'm um I'm like racist against white people breakfast because like um like Western Europe just dessert. It's it, like a thousand pounds it's of dessert. So gross. Western Europe, Western European, and then like American farm breakfast. Um, I just can't eat because like gentle listener, um, I have a, I have the disability of being unable to eat eggs and nuts. Um, and it just turns out that like, what is breakfast? If you're from like a Western European or like American, basically American, um, uh, culture, it's, um, a bunch of things with eggs, things with eggs in them. You take things that don't have eggs like, uh, bread, uh, and then you dip them in eggs and then you deep fry them in eggs. Um, and then you serve them with a side of eggs and that's, you call that French toast with eggs. Um, which is bizarre. It is bizarre. We could do a whole episode on why, what was the conspiracy that made eggs like the breakfast thing? Because there's nothing inherent about eggs that says they should be the breakfast thing. And that has, that has to have been a marketing scheme at some point, like, like the got milk campaign or I blame the milk military industrial complex that has been persecuting me since um, I was in my mother's womb. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That sounds like a whole episode in and of itself. Yeah. It's definitely the like milk industrial complex. The, yeah. the milk military. You said military. Yeah, military industrial 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 complex. And I said, and I said milk, but of course I meant eggs because, um, because milk is fine, but eggs are, eggs are, eggs are evil. Um, oh, so the eggs military it's, industrial it's an, complex. It's an egg military industrial complex. Yes. Okay. Um, and, and this is because it's military. I'm assuming this means that they threw eggs at you. Um, people when have thrown eggs at me before and, uh, like, I mean, you know, like hoodlums on the street, um, in the bad streets of Spokane, youths, Washington, youths, 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 throwing eggs, throwing eggs from moving cars, possibly because they are on substances. Um, uh, yeah. And I thought, I remember thinking to myself, like, 
huh, you don't realize that that is actually a much more serious thing for me than it is for a normal person. <laughs> um, You're, it's like the, uh, I forget what anime it's from, but the anime meme where he's holding up the butterfly and he says, is this, it's like, is this being hate crimed? Is that what this is? <laughs> oh no. <laughs> that, uh, yeah, that sounds like my life. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, I don't know how to transition out of throwing eggs at you and a form of low-key hate crime into the topic of today, but I'm excited enough about the topic today that I, I'm not going to stretch myself to, to transition too, too much. Um, cause today we're talking about, uh, the, the, the assumption, Boot. this Catholic, this Catholic motif of the assumption as it's depicted in art. Um, and th I like this topic because it is, uh, you know, my favorite thing that we do on this podcast, which is just being really, 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 really inside baseball and inclusive, but sort of, uh, or, or, or you know, exclusive and then, but sort of inviting people to become part of that, uh, inner club, because there's just so many layers. Not only we're we talking about the assumption, which nobody knew, really knows what the hell that is, but then on top of that, we're talking about art about the assumption. So there's, there's layers of exclusivity to this, uh, that I really enjoy. I enjoy being inside baseball that way. Um, I'm curious though, th this was a topic that you actually had suggested and, and I'm wondering, uh, what about this was specifically attractive to you and something that excited you as a potential subject for an episode? Well, part of it, um, is that, uh, the day of the assumption, you might say who or what is being assumed, um, since, you know, this is, uh, uh, I remember a very funny story about, uh, um, I think it was a, I think it was an old Dominican, um, uh, who was teaching like in high school and asked a student who was supposed to be like receiving some sacrament or something like who, but was kind of like not really paying attention. Um, like, okay, so what is like, what happens? What do we celebrate on the, on the assumption? Uh, and the student said, we, assume that mary is in heaven <laughs> uh which is an amazing i believe this actually earned him a uh, physical beating um because it was that kind of generation um which is amazing but um so we say uh, assumption of what assumption of the blessed virgin mary into heaven that like um at the end of her life i uh, that her body does not just decompose and rot like every other body but uh but there's something particular about who she is um in salvation about the fact that her bo her body um bore the savior uh and that uh he took flesh from her uh and that she's totally united with him um that there's something about about this relationship with christ that means that her body can't decay it's just like decay and crumble and turn into dust like like anybody else's um and so we believe that she's actually like taken even bodily uh into heaven uh either at her death or three days after her death or sometimes people think before she dies or whatever but anyway at the end of her life yeah, um, there's uh, there's there's a lot of fudging of the where death plays into this but but we are taking exception to the fact that death in this case does not mean separation of body and soul in the way that it would mean for for everyday Joe or, or like if it are. does that like the body doesn't decompose and that because the body is taken into heaven before it decomposes um right. and yeah um exactly and so uh so this is an exciting day it's a big it's a big day for christians to celebrate and uh and and uh to pray for every year or pray about every year um it's august 15th um which is spoiler alert the day that we are hoping to release this episode um and uh so that's i thought that i'm always thinking about that um august 15th is a big day for us dominicans it's the day that i made my um uh first profession of vows so the day that i like, officially became a dominican is, is the the assumption so it's always a cool personal anniversary. connection personal yeah connection. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I, like it. Um, I like it digging it digging it digging it so yeah so that's it that's kind of it for me i'd like to throw in I'm curious what you'd think about this. Um, but I was talking to a friend uh, about this recently. Um, uh, because that the, the feast of the assumption is actually coming up and maybe, maybe this explanation of the assumption is a little bit to me, right? Like maybe it's just a little bit too biased in the direction of the things I always talk about. And I'm willing to accept that, but maybe to, to get us rolling. And I'm curious what your commentary on my thought here would be. But um, one of the things that we're always talking about on this podcast, it's sort of like a, 
like an ongoing sort of B story theme that we're always touching on is the, uh, is the kind of comparative physicality of Catholicism to other religions and other, uh, other forms of Christianity, particularly right. That, that we really stress, um, physicality in a way that anthropologically and theologically differentiates us from a lot of other religious groups. And, um, we are not, as my friend said, uh, we do not consider our bodies just uh, our, consider our bodies just um, um, meat suits that we happen yeah, yeah, to yeah. be wearing. Uh, right. Where most other religious and spiritual groups do, right? And I'm not right. hating on anybody else's religious or spiritual tradition. It's just not ours, right? Um, you know, whether you're Buddhist or a Muslim or uh, you know other forms of Christianity, Lutheran, Baptist, whatever, uh, Mennonite, you know, whatever. <laughs> you probably consider, you know, your soul is your real true self um whatever the soul is as you define it and your body is sort of this again meat suit that you're just wearing for now but you will slough it off when you transcend to the higher reality of of the divine heavenly plane again however you conceptualize that uh but but catholics and again this is my wording here i'm curious what your thoughts on this would be but you know we we really differentiate ourselves um with this idea that it is ultimately sin and by extension death that wants to separate out our body and our souls that um, in the ideal state in the state god intends for us to be in we are both body and soul we are embodied spirits we are one thing i am my body and i am my soul and that um sin again evil anything that would seek to separate me from god uh and by extension death it seeks to separate out my body and my soul and every sin in some way seeks to drive that wedge a little bit uh more intensely but the goal of the christian is to follow after christ who we believe by being incarnate right this word incarnate uh was fully integrated body and soul most perfectly so we're following after him to try to become by his grace more and more and more integrated over the course of our lives and we look to mary the Virgin Mary, the mother of God, uh, the mother of Jesus, as kind of the, the proto example of what it means to follow Christ most perfectly. She has the most perfect earthly relationship with him. And, and therefore, uh, it makes sense that she also is, is therefore the most integrated that we can imagine a person being um, free from sin and, and fully, fully integrated body and soul. And so death cannot separate her the same way that it seeks to separate us. And I, I think that that's sort of how I understand the assumption um, as an artist, as someone who really stresses physicality, uh, as someone who's really proud of that element of Catholicism. That's why it makes sense to me. It seems like a natural logical conclusion, this idea of Mary sort of beaming up to heaven alien style, right? Because it's like, oh yeah, well, sure. If sin is the thing that separates my body and soul, and I'm meant to be perfectly integrated and Mary was sinless and therefore perfectly integrated, of course she wouldn't go and like disintegrate. Um, I don't know that that logic makes sense to me. That's how it jives with me. But, but what do you think about that idea? Am I missing something there? Are there nuances that you think need to be added? No, I mean, I think that's, I think that's an interesting way of thinking about it in the, uh, like this, this gift of integration. Um, and that like ultimately like one of the, well, the, the final and, uh, worst consequence of, of sin, well, except for damnation is, um, I, uh, is that we endure everyone endures um the separation of the soul from the body um from like the point of death until um the end of time you know when we mm -hmm. believe that we get our bodies back um and then like that's just that's just a a reality of sin that we all bear uh and even even if somebody's blessed in heaven all these things they don't have their bodies yet until the end of time um and that i'd say that's one nuance i would say is that that is broadly held in the christian tradition so there are there are christians uh who don't hold to the actual resurrection of the flesh at the end of time um but um but m most do um so mm. uh so like the the notion in the end that like in the end of, of all things that we will have our bodies back uh that we will be in, in reintegrated as body and soul is, is a uh sort of fundamental christian belief um 
But there is this essential reality that like Mary is the one who doesn't have to wait to the end of time that she she receives this like she just continues the reality that is hers, uh, which is this, as you say, is a way, a way of putting it, this kind of perpetual integration that never su- suffers any artificial rupture. Um, I was I was tricked when I was in college into doing a very ill fated mission trip to Nicaragua. And that's nice. a whole separate story. Um, but while there, one of the highlights was I was teaching this group of, of kids who we had been uh, forewarned and, and assured were these super, super like devout Catholic kids, all of whom were like seniors in high school. And some of whom were going in a seminary and it was going to be so great. And they all show up in their 10 to 16, which is just the widest margin yeah. um, that you never want to teach. Uh, almost none of them speak any English and they are all avowed atheists all of them oh my gosh and, okay and it's just exciting. very very different so i'm like scrambling and rewriting talks and rewriting stuff and i remember <laughs> teaching um teaching this group of boys about this idea of the resurrection of the body the idea at the end of all things that 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 integration comes to bear and and we are reintegrated body and soul with a perfected body perfected soul and everything's hunky dory right and there was this little kid and um i don't think this accent is racist i'm gonna do it he was like i was like okay what did you learn alejandro and he was like i learned that god loves me so much that he wants to give me heaven and it's gonna be so great but then he wants to give me something even better than heaven after heaven and i was like yeah that's that's basically it that's 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 all okay. i'll take that i'll take that you know what i'll, I'll we'll, we'll we'll stick with that we'll stick with yeah. that yeah yeah that's oh my gosh that's amazing yeah, that's was amazing really shout yeah. out to alejandro yeah okay. shout out alejandro so like <laughs> but it is weird i mean this this idea like how this comes into like explicit formulation in christian ideas like so it's the first time that we see clear written down like in the historical documents in a way that we can point to um formulated christian understanding of like this idea that mary's like perpetual integration and her perpetual union which is the fruit of perpetual union with christ means that like she her body is never like ripped away from her soul um and then mm-hmm. it just goes with her to heaven um the first time that we see this like written down in a way that we can recognize is in the fourth century there's this um kind of strange text that's written in in greek i believe but it's known um to us in this latin name the transitus Maria, so the, the the departure of mary or the passing away of mary um and it's written from the perspective of John the Evangelist or John, John the Beloved Disciple. So already right. it's like way to way to call there in a second. Anyway, but it's written from the perspective of John uh, about Mary's passing. And it's got this like um, it's it, it's this major text for like Christian tradition for understanding and receiving things. Um, I kind of wanted to one major way that this influences um, art, like visual depiction of art is um how it, that gets received in the Latin tradition. So like the kinds of art, the stuff that we're looking at specifically, like um, in from Western Europe. Um, so it gets received big time into uh, like the Latin tradition. And so like, let me just translate for you real quick. Um, one of the major sources um, that, that where, where this story, this like fourth century Greek story becomes like really hot. Um, Sidebar. In- I do hate, because i'm jealous when you say that when you just go let me translate real quick because it makes you like the sidekick in every indiana jones type movie oh, when it's you just true. look yeah, at the just, tomb and you're like let you me just, just read translate it real this quick. real quick let me just he who oh, enters this, is, this tomb yeah oh this is half for all acadian eternity. half chinese half <laughs> uh lost or uh, Arc- antarctic language but i just translated it in two seconds without a dictionary and it's not really a big deal it's fine turns out they use latin letters it's not really something you should worry you're, about you're the um, closest to that character trope that i know in real life that would drive yeah. me crazy when you say i, tra- I do like, i live this i live this this, quick, this is so. my dream this is my jam this is what i do yeah this is what i do i do Go find ahead, do lost thing, manuscripts do your thing. okay so this is so this is from uh gregory tour uh wrote this um book of miracles um uh Anyway, he dies in 594, so it's it's written sometime before then. Uh, and it goes like this. So, um, uh, at last, uh, when the course of the Blessed Mary's life had come to its close, 
Um, and she was called out of this world. All of the apostles were gathered together, each from their place where they were, to her house. Um, uh, when they heard that she was going to be assumed from a uh, taken from this world, uh, they all kept watch with her together. And behold, the Lord Jesus came with his angels and receiving her soul, handed it to Michael, the archangel and departed. At dawn, however, um, the apostles lifted up the, the beer uh, with her body uh, and placed it in a tomb and kept watch over it, uh, awaiting the return of the Lord. And behold, the Lord again appeared to them uh, to take the holy body uh, and ordered it to be born into the clouds in paradise. And now, where now, uh, having reassumed its soul, um, it enjoys with, uh, it exults with all of the elect um, and enjoys the good things of eternity that know no end. Okay, so that's it. So that's that's like, that's the version of the story. That's the whole thing. It's, it's pretty short. That's why I thought it'd be just fun to read the whole thing. Um, that's the version one- where... This is one version. It's and one version of versions where she just immediately beams up, doesn't die at all. Other thing, you know, there are like lots of different depictions of this. There are different depictions of, the, of this. Yeah. So this is just one of them. It's his adaptation of this, of this fourth century text, the Transitus Maria. Um, it, this is a really, 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 really big deal text um, in, in the Latin West. Um, Gregory of Tours text is a really big deal. And, um, and it has a huge influence on artistic depiction. It's not the only source, but it's a major one that has it. So, like a lot of the things that you're going to be seeing in artistic depictions are going to be getting it from um gregor tour um and from the 13th century collection the golden legend which is also getting it um, in part from gregory tour so um so for us like if you look at a if you look at a depiction of the assumption of the virgin mary that's made in like western europe um it's it's this story that we just read um that's going to be kind of mostly informing it probably um now just like as a word to be said about that um one scholar the assumption made this really helpful point that i think is just an important um kind of hermeneutic like a, a way of understanding christian beliefs that i think we just always have to have on our radar um like i try to be very careful to speak about these things when we're talking about the historical evidence of, of of these things to say like the the first time when we can track it down in a in a text that survives or some kind of some kind of thing that survives is like the fourth century okay right um it's, Christianity really pops off in the fourth century Let's in, just in a lot of ways yeah but it's it's just really we can't logically draw from that the idea that that this text invents the belief like there's, there's, right. there's a way in which you, that that might be kind of intuitive to say like well yeah so it was never it was never said before and then somebody writes this text and it becomes hot and then people start talking about it so this text invented it um but unfortunately like that's just an, or maybe whatever it is like that's just not good historical thinking and we have to recognize that like we have no evidence of that. Um, one, so this one good scholar of the, of the assumption, he just, he, this is the way he puts it. He says, um, the belief was never founded on this fourth century story. He says the story was founded on the belief and testifies to the fact of that belief. Um, that's also, um, that's also uh, a historical interpretation, you know? So just speaking, strictly speaking as a historian, um, we can say, with absolute certainty, neither with the one nor the other, um, neither that this text is the source of uh, of the belief, nor that it is um, just a testament to a belief that was already pre existing. Right. Um, you have to have, uh, and I always say this to people, and and religious people get their you know, panties in a twist about it, but I always say like. To be a a really devout Catholic, you have to actually accept a certain amount of healthy agnosticism, right? Because there are just some things you got to be comfortable not being totally sure of, just as a matter of historical record. But I will say that what you're saying is just anthropologically true. I mean, like, let's take it out of the religious context. Um, no one in their right mind would ever look at, like, Grimm's fairy tales, for instance, 
and say that the first time these fairy tales are told is when Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm write them down in the 1800s, <laughs> right? right? Yeah. They, they're, col- they're going back in because they're seeing a cultural shift happening where they're worried these stories that have been passed down exclusively by oral tradition are going to get lost, and that's when they write them down. That's the same thing that you see happen with uh, African-American folk tradition. That's the same thing you see with basically every major religious group. Shit only gets written down when people start saying, oh, there's enough of a cultural shift happening that we should probably start keeping a permanent record of stuff we've all just been kind of mutually aware of for a couple hundred years right so this isn't whenever anybody says oh it wasn't written until the fourth century they're kind of missing how human groups tend to document things throughout history i don't know i think that that's a worthy thing to consider as well yeah no that's 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 exactly right so i think um I think the way that it spreads and how widespread it is, um, but in a in a very short period of time, historically speaking, it further testifies to that to that idea that in fact this is a this is a literary monument, something that was more widely held um, rather than a genesis moment. Um, and um, and in fact, like now speaking strictly from faith. Um, uh, in the 1950s, the Pope, um, you know, the Pope actually very rarely. Um, speaks in this definitive like um with the protection of the holy spirit this if jesus christ is who we believe he is this has to this has to be true like the Mm -hmm. pope very rarely it was supposedly like infallible right that's what we call it like sometimes people think that like you know whatever when the pope talks about his breakfast that's infallible but like they (laughs) almost never like just literally a handful of times in all of history um and one of them was in the 1950s um where um he proclaimed uh that this idea the doc that that the assumption is actually an essential part of christian revelation um and that is necessary for belief as a christian um and that's a you know so 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 that's a that's the church taking almost 2000 years um to think really hard and reflect really hard about this question and to say like does this story have a genesis point other than the gospel or is it in fact just the part of the gospel and after like 1900 years the church was willing to say like actually this is just the gospel so we just yeah this is just true um gotta swallow it all kit and caboodle all yeah at once. it's all one thing yeah which is all neat so um but I again talk- this idea of integration right it's right. all fully integrated it's all it's prego sauce it's all in there you know yeah totally so like so i want to talk like let's let's talk just a little bit let's like i would say let's switch to to um to talking about some of the arts that come out of this because it's just such an interesting feast you know um and i think that you can see right away so one thing just that liturgic is liturgically this is present from very rapidly so we ha- we have a clear evidence of this as a liturgical feast that people are celebrating like at mass and stuff by the sixth mm-hmm. century um in the and east by liturgical feast we mean essentially a holiday um well also like prayers that people will say at mass um sure yeah so yeah. but also like a holiday but yeah and um and then um Pope Sergius the first, um, who's Pope from 689 to 701, uh, he introduces it to Rome. Um, and so it's, so it's a, so it's a feast in Rome by about 700. Um, and then it kind of, then it's a feast everywhere, you know? Um, so that's, and it's all, it's already on August 15th. So it's very old on that date. Um, so it's cool. And of course, if it's in the liturgy, people are praying with it, then like it's, people have this hot desire to like depict it somehow because if you're praying with it like people want to be able like just these visual visual things just help people pray with these realities a lot more deeply so the fact that it's in the liturgy so quickly um helps understand why there's so much art about of the assumption which in this ton um but i think also the story itself and just uh it's just very provocative um and you can see how it's really reflect really productive of like artistic theological devotional reflection um so well, if i can throw yeah, in please go I'm ahead gonna, no you let me, go ahead, let me just because this is why i was stressing the whole idea of integration so hard right i'm just going to speak very personally here i've got some friends all over kind of the artistic community um most are agnostic some are uh, but but of the ones who are religious, some are Protestants, some are Mormons, um, some are you know other non non Christian religions. Um, I have all the respect in the world for these people. I have a personal intellectual difficulty 
understanding how they can spiritually value their own art. I'm sure they can, but my ability to find spiritual value in my own art very explicitly stems from this idea that Christ is calling us to integration mm. and that physicality is actually important. If, if my body is just a meat suit that my soul is wearing, uh, is wearing for right now, and it is meant to pass away when I ascend to a, a higher reality of divinity, then the painting I paint or the dance I do or the theme park attraction I design or the book I write is as bullshit as am I, right? And it is only effective as basically a if it's effective at all, if it's meaningful at all, it's only effective as propaganda to convert other people to my religion so that they too can ascend to that higher ethereal plane, right? But if my body is me, if if physicality is a is a good, is a good, is the good, then my art is an extension of that good. It's not just propaganda to sell other people on the the pyramid scheme multi-level marketing thing that is Christianity. It's it's actively a way to worship. And so for me as a Catholic artist, again, I am sure that there are many, many, many Christian artists, some of whom I'm even in close relationship with, who have their own personal spirituality, these things, and I respect that. But just in my own little biased way, I don't get how art means anything if this kind of physical integration idea, this central thesis of Catholicism isn't the central thesis of what it means to exist. And from that angle, um, things like the assumption, things like the ascension, things like the stigmata and relics, as we talked about in our relics episode, right? These uber physical things that Catholicism jives with that other religious groups, other forms of Christianity get freaked out by to me, those those are the things that get me going. And those are the things that makes my creative brain tick because they are the kind of most extreme and most explicit expressions of this radical sacred physicality that we're all about. So that, I mean, I guess that's my pitch into this episode is the assumption is important theologically, but it's really, really, really important artistically because it justifies why art is necessary in stressing the physicality. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I agree. I agree completely. Like it's, it's, um, it's this definitive revelation and this is why this is, um, a part of the theological understanding of why, um, in the fifties, the Pope declares that this is in fact, just a part of the gospel and not, um, uh, a pious belief, you know, just, just a pious belief that you can kind of take or leave. Um, because it's, it's, considered a revelation like a part of the revelation of jesus christ is the revelation of the dignity of the human body and its elevation um to being fully ordered ordered to and integrated by the soul um by by the human thing the human person being totally integrated by the and human integrated in thing man god you know the exactly human thing man we need we need cigarettes for episodes like this we really do Wouldn't we need be to just be able to kick back ah oh, the human thing man <laughs> <laughs> um well listen i want to i have a couple of pieces of art that i want to talk about but maybe you want to tell people for a hot, a hot second about some pieces of art that they can get their hands on yeah i think i think that's a good idea uh we happen as a podcast to work with an organization called catholic creatives um, and another organization catholic.store uh, and these are really really great resources for and by artists think like zoom you know when you were a kid for kids by kids this is like that but with catholic artists so catholic creatives for its part is this organization dedicated to uniting um, different creatives across the catholic world uh, in prayer and in mutual collaboration. Uh, and to do this, they support artists and promote them through primarily a, a private Facebook group and meetups all across the country and workshops and summits and things like this. Uh, but it does take a community to bring big ideas like these to life. So by supporting uh, the Catholic Creatives Patreon, uh, you directly contribute to future workshop summits, uh, resources like this podcast, in fact, meant to support artists around the globe. And on top of that, if you want to get your hands on some of the art made by those very creatives, I'd encourage you to go to uh, catholic.store, 
not catholic.com or .org or anything like that, just catholic.store. You can get a lot of cool shit made by uh, independent artisans from all across the Catholic world, uh, very worthy causes. I'd, I'd strongly encourage you to join up, be a part of the community, uh, support as much as you can. We're all creatives at the end of the day, and we create better when we are united, when we are, again, using this word, integrated together. So visit catholiccreatives.org uh, forward slash support to check out that Patreon and catholic.store to check out those products today. But go ahead. Yeah, man, because I'm, I'm really – you do this great thing as a – as a priest where you will kind of teach a concept through different artworks that uh, often artworks that would surprise people, right? Some very weird artworks, sometimes some very traditional artworks and by juxtaposing them. Um, this was one of the things that initially, you know, attracted me to you as a friend and as kind of a spiritual guide. Uh, so I'm very excited to have you unpack some of the, the artworks that you think are inspired by this idea of integration and assumption and all these kinds of things. Um, what do you, what do you have for us to start off with? Right. So first, um, there's this there's this great ivory plaque from about 1000 um that uh from the it's, year 1000 <laughs> uh that just depicts what's called the dormition of the virgin um that means it's a it's a image type that's very standard in um the kind of greek speaking and eastern parts of the church from very early on um this image becomes like very standardized you know um i and so this image, the, this particular one that I'm thinking of, that's from from a thousand, is actually a Western image, but it's anyway has the, has the the type. And what it is is that you have Mary uh, lying on a bed in the center, lower center of the image. Um, all around her are all the apostles, um, and then Christ is kind of standing behind uh, the bed, and he is holding in his arms. Um, Mary's soul, um, mm. and it's wrapped to look like a, like a body in, um, in bands, right? Uh, and in this particular one, it's, you can see it's very directly engaging with, um, these, te the text, some of the textual sources, uh, because in the upper right hand corner, then there's an angel, which we know from the text is going to be Michael carrying that same soul. So carrying Mary's soul. So it's, a, you know, three stages of the same, of the same reality, Mary dying, Christ taking her soul, and then Christ handing Mary's soul to, to, uh, to Michael, and then presumably they all go to heaven. But that's like, that's where it ends. Um, mm. It's uh, this is a classic type again. Like you go into any kind of Byzantine church, uh, or and then a, even a lot of Western churches. Like this is what you're going to see. This is going to be the, the, the depiction of the Dormition. Um, there's a lot that is cool about it, like artistically and conceptually. That's really grabbing. Um, one is that um, in Byzantine churches um, from like uh, about the ninth century onwards, there becomes a fairly standardized um, set of like um, images of the life of Christ that will be in the kind of second tier um, around the church, um, like higher than you reach, but you can see, you can see them easily. And um, by about like the 12th century, it becomes very common to do all kinds kinds of juggling with like the physical location of, of the this like life of christ cycle and the order that things go in and how they work so that you are going to be paralleling on opposite sides of the church the nativity so mary giving birth to christ with the assumption or the dormition whatever we want to call it um because these images are actually super duper similar because the Byzantine, um, Eastern, whatever you want to call it, like depiction of the nativity looks almost identical. It's Mary in like the lower center of the image. She's lying down, uh, and she is hold and on either like a kind of a bed thing or sometimes kind of like an altar kind of thing, kind of like a grave. Um, and she Jesus is holding is gonna be wrapped Jesus in those burial cloths wrapped that are also swaddling cloths, clothes, swaddling cloths. Baby. Exactly. Yeah exactly and then like there'll be there'll be people around angels so it's a super similar image and by the 12th century in, in uh, a lot of the byzantine world they get these even further modifications where like um mary's soul begins to be depicted as like like a baby like seated on christ's arm and he's turned towards her using mary's own posture 
um, of like the caring mother from these from many of these kind of like virgin and child images. So like there's this perfect inversion that's that's presented um, artistically and and then spatially and physically. So like one side of the church has the nativity physically facing the other or like if they're if they're um in um pendentives or something they'll be like next to each other um uh over a gap right so that so that but the, the parallelism is hugely important um that like it's the art the individual images express what they express they tell the story of the reality and then together they convey the theological oomph of the story which is mm. that like this isn't just that like god god loved mary the best and so he gave her some cool superpower that he didn't give to anybody else which is that she like her you know whatever like her body didn't know corruption it's that like this drama of like christ taking flesh from the virgin mary um is that she is so fully integrated in her person and so fully united to christ um that she can know no separation from him and that as she brings him out of her womb uh so he brings her out of the womb of death into into heaven with no corruption you know that it's like one movement i have a friend who's a who's a nurse who works primarily i forget the the title of the discipline she primarily works with the the dying what's that called again uh, is that palliative care palliative care, palliative care. sure palliative care. that's what it is thanks so she she primarily works with those people um but they were recently short staffed in the hospital and she had to co-work uh the the birth unit oh that's different was was talking about how it wasn't actually different at all cool that what she was doing to help these women bring a baby into the world and the things she was saying to them and the care she was providing to them as they brought a baby into the world is exactly what she's doing to help someone be birthed out of the world into heaven and that th- this is really the the visual parallel that's being drawn with these things is mary is bringing jesus into the world and he is birthing her out of it yeah, uh, and that these these awesome. images only kind of make sense in regards to each other because they're telling a macro story about right. what it means to be born into the next life and born into this one and and the relationship between those two things. That's so cool. What a cool what a cool connection. That's really that's really powerful. And you're totally right about the birthing thing like the um uh, even even the fact that like a lot of these sort of like uh, later Byzantine images will like so directly give Jesus Mary's posture uh, and Mary's soul Jesus's posture um, like that intentional um, uh, gender inversion uh, is like is drawing this out um, that, mm-hmm. that Christ is like bearing her bearing her into the next world uh, well into into heaven you know which is Mm -hmm. just like this dramatic dramatic thing um and you see like there's this kind of conceptual and visual and artistic and theological freedom there and how to depict it you know so they're not squeamish about like oh no but like will people think that we're saying that jesus is a big lady and it's like well no i mean (laughs) like uh jesus is is the biggest lady watch your mouth lady that's right um (laughs) so that's that freedom i think is really beautiful like informed by this like theological freedom you know this like richness of the heart um is there some on an artistic level is there any significance do you know to the fact that this is being depicted on ivory is it just because that's a sacred or not a sacred but like a precious element a rare and sought after element or is there something about the imagery that's being used that pairs with that medium somehow no i don't i don't think so in particular to be honest i mean okay there are definitely images where the physicality of ivory is radically critical to the um to the um drama of the image as an art as an art form um as a narrative art or theological art or whatever whatever it might be yeah that's what i'm asking um this particular one i wouldn't say particularly um okay i would not particularly um but um all right so let me let me let me let me propose another one though um please yeah uh that's really rich and this is actually from Raphael. if you've ever heard of him he's a ninja turtle um yeah mm -hmm. uh, it's really amazing that he was able to paint what he was considering the fact that he was in fact a turtle yeah but since he spent so much time fighting crime and eating pizza but um i uh, so he um so in like 1502 1503 um he built he paints this altar piece that's known um to us as the odd the altar piece o-d-d-i and um 
it's so dramatic as another vision of this that you can see that again um Raphael is responding to a different artistic and theological movement in that story that we heard at the beginning and this has um Christ coming back with all the apostles waiting around the tomb and now taking Mary's body into heaven and it's super dramatic because um you have the whole scene is divided dramatically physically into halves um top bottom half uh so the bottom half has the tomb this big stone like intense um sarcophagus tomb uh set with this amazing visual perspective to be kind of like three quarter angle so you see diagonally into the whole thing with the with the apostles around it and the tomb is empty and is full except that it is full of flowers that are oh, springing wow. from it which is glorious so there's a lot in this about um the way that the church has for a long long time read um mary with the song of songs um which is all the time talking about um uh the comparing the beloved the spouse of christ to flowers all kinds of flowers um mm -hmm. and so there's something about this already um so so there's no body in it anymore but it's full of flowers the where so where there should be death there is only life which is fascinating um and life of a of a pure and a beautiful kind um and then the top half of the image is now mary very corporeal very corporeal no like little mystical soul wrapped in swaddling bands very bo very bodily um and christ is crowning her um mm -hmm. there's angels and stuff like this um and it's just and it's it's Raphael and kind of like peak Raphael, you know, and so it's um so Christ is this tender, they're kind of like the same age and Christ Everything's is Everything's a little bit fuzzy with lighting because that's the shit that he loved to do. Yeah, it's this rich, yeah, this rich rich lighting and like it's just um uh so there's so much life in the image, you know, and it's um it has this huge dynamism to it i mean you can tell okay this is Raphael. it's the 16th century now it's a very different sense of how art um can think about theological realities um but one thing that i love about it is that now um it invests like i think it kind of unveils a lot of the drama of this scene like you can think, you can think like a lot of the ways we can talk about the assumption is just kind of these negations like well mary's body like doesn't corrupt you know that it doesn't rot in the ground that like um it doesn't separate from her soul um now in these versions of the story it does for like a brief period of time um paralleling christ's right it's three days so parallel parallels so that she's more closely united with christ is the is the idea in the end there are sure, other yeah. versions where she there are other ways of thinking about the story so what i love about this image is it has this rich physicality to it and it gives you a totally different way of thinking about the theological potential of the scene so um here um okay again now we're working with the same version of the, of the story where like mary uh's body does separate from her soul for just these three days that then like mirror um christ's three days right uh in the tomb so that's the idea is, is try this absolutely perfect parallelism with christ's life um there are other versions of telling the story and thinking about the story um where christ where mary never dies at all and she just she, her, her, her soul is literally never separated from her body um i uh, but like i love that they, that Raphael's vision like opens up this hugely dynamic sense about like that there is nothing negative about this it's not like just that she like she doesn't die she doesn't corrupt she doesn't or, or she doesn't um rot in the ground like all these things but like that actually what happens with mary the assumption is this like explosion of life you know that mm -hmm. like life cannot be contained you know and it explodes as it were out of the tomb explodes out of the hold of death um with so with so as it were such great force that it is simply carried to heaven you know that there is that the transition between heaven earth and heaven is so um driven by the dynamism of the of the life of god that it just carries her through you know i mentioned and, and i don't want to get us too off track by bringing this up but as you're describing this it uh, it occurs to me i mentioned Grimm's fairy tales earlier to just kind of parallel how folk tradition works uh but it, for those who might be unfamiliar with the motifs of the assumption depicted um, explicitly you are actually still familiar with the motifs of the assumption if you've seen 
any version of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs because most of the artistic depictions of that borrow pretty heavily from depictions of the Assumption. What? Um, Are you serious? Well, yeah, there's a lot of contemporary literary argument that Snow White is uh, meant to be a Christ allegory where she is humankind in the form of Eve eating the apple and then the prince comes to her in death and brings her back out and brings her to his father's house. And so most of the time, interesting um, when it's depicted, you can draw pretty close visual parallels between sort of the dwarves with their hats in their hands as the apostles kind of surrounding Mary in the glass coffin with all of the stirring snow white as Mary in the glass coffin with all the flowers bursting forth. And here's the kind of castle in the clouds behind the scene. And here comes the prince and crowns her. Um, all of those artistic motifs are there. They're, they're pretty intentionally borrowed by any illustrator or animator, whoever works with that, that thing. So I think that's just an interesting thing to throw in culturally that, that even even if you're not aware of the assumption that probably you're aware of these these visual ideas that is so intense like i love that i love that insanely that's so <laughs> cool like that's yeah. yeah no no i mean but see this is the thing like this is why um like it's so critical to have a like a literate visual imagination you know of like we have to know what what our own symbols mean you know, like, cause these things are powerful. Like even, even for people who, who, um, I theologically, religiously don't hold these convictions. Like these are so rich in our whole visual imagination. They just like make up how we think about the world, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I just want to say one last thought about, there's so much more to say about the assumption. Um, but like yeah, for now, I think easily be a nine hour episode. Yeah, exactly. But fortunately, the assumption comes every year. So, you know, pray for us, God willing, that we'll have like a uh, assumption part de, um next year. But like, <laughs> but just one thought I kind of want to leave this with is that like, artistically, there's this very strange but fascinating reality that um, almost never, I only know one exception in my own visual experience, uh, almost never is Christ depicted in the act of resurrecting, like the body coming to visual life with in union with the soul hmm, almost never i have only seen it once in my entire life um i was talking to an art history professor who had never seen it um and so was shocked that i had seen it ever once um it is however relatively common to see the virgin mary in the physical act of coming from the dead um so there's this amazing um it's a tympanum of a of a portal on the saint Lee cathedral in france it looks like saint lys but it's saint Lee uh cathedral from a um in the in the gothic periods so of from 1170 um and it's amazing because in fact what do you see but like mary the main image is mary being crowned but down below you see uh this body being pulled awake basically by angels and it's this Mm. fascinating idea that like the resurrection of christ is so fundamentally divine and mysterious that like artists except for like the almost vanishingly rare uh exception will not touch it they just want it to be shrouded in in god's own mystery and god's own light um but mary fascinatingly they feel free to un- unveil the way in which Mary herself is a revelation of the potential of the human person, like the destiny of the human body and like the destiny that's like given, like the calling that's given to the human person. And like, I love that. And I love that difference. Well, and isn't that ultimately one of the many points of, of the role that Mary serves in our lives is being this point of accessibility to her son and to the father because only you know jesus as i've often said jesus could uh show us how to live in every way through every situation the only thing he couldn't show us is how to be in perfect relationship with him because how Mm -hmm. do you show how to be in perfect relationship with yourself and that's what we need mary and she's our entry point for for kind of knowing how the heck to do all of this uh how to be close with him this way and so of course artists would feel more more comfortable using her as an access point to this mystical reality. I I want to throw it out to you guys listening at home. You know, there's, there's been a lot of 
room for artistic uh, thought today to get your creative juices going. There are a lot of motifs for depicting uh, to to depict uh, in your own art form. How would you choose to depict the assumption uh, in a way that maybe it hasn't been before? What particular version of this narrative are you most attracted to when you're listening to us describe this? How could you depict all of these things, not only through the visual arts of painting illustration, but also maybe through dance, through song, through whatever your chosen creative path is, however God is communicating his personal and unique call to integrate yourself uh, to you. I encourage you to follow that call. And with that, uh, from me and Father Gabriel, go forth and create cool things. You've been listening to Creator Things, a podcast of Catholic creatives, hosted by Father Gabriel Toretta OP and Jacob Flores Popcheck, produced by Jessica Flores Popcheck and Kyle Meineke. To find out more about how you can support the podcast and other ventures for artists, visit catholiccreatives.org forward slash support. 